Chapter 31 Caracas, an eagle's nest in the Andes. God loves his children. Arnaldo's eldest sister, Maria, had made their departure easier by giving her two brothers a nice farewell party. All misunderstandings were set aside. Arnaldo and Franco left Argentina later with a light heart. Damiano seemed happy to be leaving. Arnaldo and Franco, for the first time since they left Italy, felt as if they were following a destiny with a promising future in store. Italy was suffering the scars of World War II, and there wasn't any future for the two boys. Staying home in Europe had not been an option for them. The letter from Irma in Castelnuovo asking the two young men to move to Caracas had come at a time when they were both ready to step out of the routine of a job and step into a career. That would see them pave their own future. Damianos was pleased to be able to show Dan and Gustavo parts of what South America had to offer at the time. The train ride along Brazil's east coast was long and uneventful, except perhaps for their two days spent in Rio de Janeiro. Dan couldn't get enough of the vibrant and intoxicating life in the big city. He loved the beaches, the nightlife, the inviting atmosphere and the people. He was not thrilled to leave the place, but knew that his future did not reside in this country or city. When their flight from Rio de Janeiro landed in French Guiana, the transition hit them like a hammer in the face. The country, which was still run by the French government, lives in the shadow of colonisation, separatism and even racism. Black people were going to the back of the queue. They were hired hands, not to say slaves, in the cane plantations populating parts of the country or domestics for the prominent French families living in Cayenne. The proximity of the French penal colony, which made Papillion, story famous in the latter part of the 20th century, was still very much a blot on the landscape of the country. Have you read the book? Damien Ost asked his companions. Yes, and I saw the movie, Dan replied, smiling. Do you think the story was true to life? Yes, it was, Dan. Henry Carreri lived in the colony for the better part of his life. His memoirs of the time he spent there are a true record of the penal colony's routine. The interesting fact about his story is that at one point of his life he became a Venezuelan citizen. He died in 1979 from throat cancer in Madrid, while iterating for the upteenth time that he never committed the murder for which he was found guilty and sent to French Guiana. That reminds me of another coincidence that touches on our own history, Dan commented. If I'm not mistaken, according to the book, Carreri first escaped from the colony only 37 days after arriving on the island. He and his two companions sailed north and landed in Rio Arche in Colombia. Really? Gustavo said. That's interesting. But how did he get to Venezuela? Sorry, I didn't read the book. Too busy fighting for my own survival in Iraq. Well, that happened much later, Damienos went on. After being recaptured in Colombia and returned to the French colony... Carreri made several attempts to regain his freedom. Many failed until he finally escaped successfully eleven years after his arrival on Devil's Island and landed his raft on the coast of Venezuela where he was imprisoned for a further year and ultimately released as a Venezuelan citizen. All I can say is that I should pick up a book or two the next time I go past the library, Gustavo concluded as he returned to looking at the landscape outside the train window. When they landed at their next destination... Suriname, Dan felt as if he had seen the place before. Something about it was very familiar. Going to one of the beaches near the hotel gave him his answer. One of them looked very much like Miami Beach. He had not known he was in South America. He would readily believe he was in Florida. Paramaribo reminded the travellers of Alabama in the US. Dan had the impression of deja vu again, and when they arrived in Guiana and stopped in Georgetown for a couple of days, Gustavo was beginning to get impatient. I wish we were there already, he said as the three men were having breakfast before climbing aboard yet another plane. It's been a much longer trip than I imagined. I must admit that I'm not one for long flights. I like to get where I'm going the next minute I've decided to go. Damien Oost chuckled at the remark. I'm sorry, Gustavo, but this journey was part of the experience you and Dan needed to realise how far you were from your nearest relative. Once again, your Ricciuli ancestors have been separated and uprooted due to events which they could not control. As you remember, most of your ancestors, from your earliest recorded past to the 21st century, have followed their hearts and past that led them to success. You experienced defeat or even went astray. It was never truly of your own doing. Except in my case, Dan said ruefully. I felt like the runt of the litter. 
You should not feel that way, Dan. You failed in a few instances to abide by the rules or counsel from your elders, but you never did anything illegal or scandalous. You were always true to yourself. Why then persisting in risking my life at every turn? Wasn't that against the first rule of gospel? Endangering your life is your choice, Dan. It's a choice that cost your family dearly. This is why you are here, as you know. You are on your way to attain atonement for your sins. Not everyone on earth has received such a privilege. You will be back in Florida soon enough, but not before you finish the last of your tasks, reliving the early years of your father's life. But why? You tell me what happened to him. To tell about one's life and to relive a life are two different things, Dan. As you saw throughout this journey, you never could understand the lives of these men until you took active part in their existences and became them. Could you have understood Antonio Rahili the way you do now if you hadn't lived his life for a time? Dan shook his head. Of course not. It gives a whole new meaning to the experience of walking a mile in another man's shoes. I could not see or even comprehend what went through the minds of the people we heard about until I took on their lives. Exactly, Dan, Damianos agreed. Your sin could have killed you and could have disseminated your family, which was not a proposition God would accept. You needed to realise that everything your ancestors built for you through the past three or four millennia was, was not to be wasted with foolish and selfish behaviour. Well, Gustavo exclaimed, That's the first time I heard you speak that way, Damianos. Don't you think Dan here understands the predicament in which he put his family when he behaved recklessly? Thanks, Gustavo, for such a reminder as the one Damianos just gave me. It's comforting. If God and in turn Damianos did not care what happened to me, they wouldn't have taken the time and made the efforts to show me and knew the road to follow. Precisely, Dan. God cares about his children, and he has no time for indifference. You either listen and abide by the rules, or you waste your time here on earth. Two days later, the three men arrived in Legaria, the city at the foot of the seven hills surrounding Caracas. Like an eagle's nest high up and engroaching upon the hillsides, Caracas seemed to have erupted out of the mountain flanks. Glad to step off the plain, the trio took no time to find a taxi that would take them to the city. Dan and Gustavo marvelled at the engineering feats which met their gazes. It was nothing short of amazing. The road seemed to have been dug by hand along the rock face, but no matter where you looked, there were people busy doing something everywhere. It was an incredible hub of activity. Whether your eyes travelled to the creeks running from the top of the mountain, down to the valley, which hosted hundreds of women washing their clothes in buckets of varied colours, or the men on the side of yet another roadside construction, one had the impression of being dropped into a rabbit warren with thousands upon thousands of beings running and walking in every direction imaginable. I have to take a breath for these people, Gustavo remarked. They're so busy you get tired just looking at them. That's what the new country does for you, senor, the cabbie said to his passengers. We have to work hard if we want to survive here. It looks a lot more like thriving than surviving to me, Dan remarked. It's quite amazing, really. I don't think I've ever seen so many people in one place all working in unison. Yes, it reminds me of a cartoon clip, Gustavo said. Have you ever watched the Smurfs? Dan laughed at the thought. Not me, I haven't, but I think I saw my daughter watching them. Why? Well, because in one episode all the Smurfs are busy cleaning the village. This hubbub reminds me of the cartoon. Their brother-in-law, Vicente, was waiting for Arnaldo and Franco on the front stoop of his house. His grin was a tell-tale of the man's happiness. He welcomed the three companions warmly and invited them indoors. Truth be told, Dan and Gustavo were exhausted. They hardly said hello to their brother-in-law before they asked to be excused and retired to their rooms. Damianos, on the other hand, was not too tired to talk to Vicente. Thank you for coming with the boys, Damianos. I know that they could have travelled on their own, but having you accompanying them was comforting. They may be men and responsible ones at that, but temptations can be found bordering every road. Yes, I agree, Vincenti, and these two have too much to live for to stray from the path that has been traced for them. Perhaps. But they're still young, and they'll need reining in, I'm sure. Vicenti paused for a moment. Did you tell them what will be expected of them? Not any more than what the letter from Irma told us. She said that you had some work in construction for them, and that you needed a helping hand. Yes, that's correct. However, what Irma did not say in her letter is that we're about to commence the construction of roads and bridges across the valley that will probably defy all engineering propositions built thus far. And the completion of the dam's construction will certainly take another chunk of time and effort, Damianos offered. Exactly, and that's why Arnaldo's skills of electrical wiring will come very handy. As you probably know, the plans for these projects have been drawn, the money is in hand, and the government has given all of the construction companies involved the green light. The manpower is what's needed now. From what I saw coming up, I don't see that to be a problem, or is it? 
I think I thought the same as you do, Damien S., but now I'm not so sure. You see, I've started engaging some construction crew for various contracts in town when I first arrived, but these men turned out to be cheats and thieves, anything to make a quick buck. And belligerent, like you would not believe. So now I'm cautious. What's more, the work we are going to offer these men will be fairly dangerous, but this is not a circus, and there won't be any safety nets to catch them if they fall down the ravine. But I suppose the pay will be high, Damien I said, leaning to the back of his chair. Absolutely, yet there's a problem too. Money attracts the most unsavoury characters, as you probably gathered throughout your travels. Damienos nodded. So the only way we will be able to circumvent these problems is to give the men who are to be hired a test of strength and endurance. You mean you want to sort out the ones who are here to work from the ones who are here to make a quick buck? Precisely. And there will be no exception. Arnoldo and Franco will need to take the test and pass it. 